if we have a corrupt system, <laughs> that says something about us, obviously. Um, and we need to, if we want to fix that, assuming we do, do we start inside of the human heart and mind or do we start outside with the incentives? Do we do both? Like, where is this convergence between incentives and um, the extent to which we can drive our own evolution one direction or another? I think the first thing we have to recognize is that we have run off the end of the tape mm. of evolutionary processes. And it's hard to imagine a natural, gentle way back into a reasonable framework because we suffer from what Heather and I in our book call hypernovelty. Mm. Hypernovelty is the state at which the rate of change is so high that even though human beings are the fastest adapting creature that has ever existed, even our capacity to adapt is outstripped by the rate at which the environment mm. changes on us. So the environment that you and I were born into, for example, no longer exists. We are adults in some environment that didn't exist when we were kids, which means mm. that our developmental program did not prepare us properly for the world we live in. Mm. So that is a serious problem and it's making us sick across mm -hmm. essentially all domains and scales. Mm -hmm. We have to rein in that process or it will be our undoing and reining in that process is not a simple matter. But what I think people do not properly understand because of the nature of modern life is that for an ancestor living in almost any of the environments that our ancestors lived in, life would be a great deal more intuitive because mm -hmm. your perceptual apparatus would be properly calibrated for things that were actually valuable. Mm. What do I mean by valuable? I mean things that contribute to your evolutionary fitness. Which, fitness payoffs. Yes. Now, I have to point out, I do not subscribe to a standard definition of evolutionary fitness. I think this is one of the places that my field has has fallen down. Okay. But if we understand that there is something that makes you evolutionarily better off over time, mm -hmm. then you should be wired to have detectors when you're headed in a direction that seems to be enhancing it. Mm -hmm. And you should have other detectors for when you're headed in a direction where it's drying up. Mm -hmm. And then you should have some program that tells you actually ignore the signal that you're dropping in fitness because actually there's a peak mm -hmm. that if you'll if you'll mm -hmm. hold out long right. enough you're going to attain a kind of fitness you couldn't get in the environment you came from but our lives should be a great deal more intuitive than they are and they are not and that is forcing us to be what i would call conscious over decision making that is not supposed to be conscious at all mm. like what to put in your mouth that's not supposed to be a difficult choice mm -hmm. does it seem mm. like something is desirable to eat that's a good indicator you mm -hmm. should eat it does it seem like something that's repulsive maybe that's a good indicator you shouldn't and we mm. can't even treat food that way anymore because mm. lots of stuff has been built to trick us you yeah. know we have antagonists who want us to consume things that aren't good for us and they may taste very good and mm -hmm. be quite bad for you mm -hmm. Wow, um, that is so true, right? These the the smart weapons of advertisers now have turned grocery store aisles into these target rich environments. That I mean, I know, yeah, it's taken me a long time to learn through my own health journey what foods work and what foods don't because it's not always just the thing that tastes good um, that is good for you. Oh, so something you said there is really interesting to me that. You said you don't subscribe to, I think you said the standard view of evolutionary biology as it pertains to natural selection. To fitness. Fitness, okay. Uh, Robert Persig said something in his book, Leela, I just want to hear your thoughts on it. He goes, the term survival of the fittest uh, is reducible down to survival of the survivors. So it's basically kind of this tautology. Um. And that seems like it makes fitness really hard to define if we say just survival of the fittest. So could you tell me a little bit about what your view of fitness and if that view is wrong and if so, why? There is a major shift in the way you have to conceptualize things when you go from simple systems 
to complex systems, and then it happens again when you go from complex systems to complex adaptive systems. Mm -hmm. These things do not work the same way. Mm -hmm. And if you carry your simple system mindset where things can be complicated and you bring that into a truly complex system, you'll keep fumbling. Mm -hmm. One of the places that this has happened is in the tendency to want to instantiate a concept that is high quality so that we can go measure it and see if we understand it. Mm -hmm. So the instinct to take a concept like evolutionary fitness, which does have a tautology built into it, mm -hmm. a tautology that doesn't bother me even a little bit. Okay. Right? Taut we're trained, oh, tautology is the indication indicator that you've done something wrong. But in this case, what we're really saying is there are characteristics that make you more likely to persist over time. Yeah. And we must be, it makes logical sense that we would be wired to try to enhance those characteristics, right. which is of course true. So yeah. the fact that it's a tautology or a near tautology is not evidence that you've done something wrong. It's actually just saying the logic to the universe is consistent. It. It's almost like the limitation of language in a way. Right? Well, it's the limitation of science okay so it's great to know that there is something that we can describe as fitness mm -hmm. it's wonderful to want to go out into nature and look at it so you can see mm -hmm. how it behaves but the problem is you end up finding a proxy for it that's pretty good mm -hmm. so what we've done in evolutionary biology is we've found the proxy which is reproductive success mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On average, a creature that reproduces more is more fit than a creature that reproduces less, mm -hmm. on average. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 99 times in 100, if you go out and you measure reproductive success, you've seen something that's a pretty close match for fitness. And so you keep getting this reward, which is, oh, we found it. Mm -hmm. Fitness mm -hmm. is reproductive mm -hmm. success. But then anytime fitness is not reproductive success, or fitness is the inverse of reproductive success, we're confused because mm. we forgot that we took a, mm. a robust concept that mm -hmm. couldn't be instantiated, and then we took a proxy for it, which allowed us to measure it, but was imperfect. Mm. You know, and The map see, is not the territory kind of thing. The map is not the territory, and because we have lifespans like we do, you know, the original generation that wanted to measure fitness and decided that reproductive success was a good place to start, mm -hmm. they may well have understood that they were not the same thing. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. because they got such a huge reward for going out there and measuring reproductive success, because it works most of the time, they trained their students. You go out and you measure reproductive mm -hmm. success, and then they died off. And so the students don't even know it's a proxy. And so you get into this thing where you can't escape this loop, even if the original people who made the compromise could have. This is so meta. Because that sounds like the process of natural selection, what you're describing, right? Well, let's put it this way. But there's a but there's a little tinge of innovation on it, perhaps. Well, human beings are. Uh, my PhD advisor called us the uniquely unique species. Okay. We have tools that other creatures don't, or we have tools augmented to a level that they don't look anything like the analogs mm -hmm. and other creatures. And one of the things that we can do, is we can model things in our minds, so that we can play out mm -hmm. how they interact and that means that we can do a lot of work before we actually get to something that is physical mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i wish we did this better i wish we had more deeply philosophical mentors who understand the relationship between the process that we call science and the practice of science mm -hmm. because those two things have become quite remote from each other in mm -hmm. fact the the um, reductionists who mm -hmm. have effectively taken over scientists uh, or science have staged a kind of coup against theory, mm -hmm. and they've right. been they've been aided in this coup by the universities, which are fueled on grant overhead, hmm. and because it's fueled on the universities fueled on grant overhead, theorists seem like a waste of space, but the problem is. Theorists, if they're any good, they tell you where it is that it would be worth searching empirically. Right. Most space isn't worth searching because it's implausible there will be anything in it. Yeah. And 
knowing that it, it pays tremendous dividends, right? If, if you, it's like if you went and looked at a and tree. The search space is infinite, basically. Right. Yeah. And you can waste a lot of time, yeah. which th actually gives a positive signal in the university environment because you can run big experiments, you know, that are fruitless and that a good theorist could have told you were gonna, not going to mm -hmm. net anything useful. But the point is, hey, it, it netted a grant that brought in five million bucks. Hmm. So th that perverse incentive wrecks science. And we've lost track of how much we can do with careful thinking. Mm. Um, and hopefully we will rediscover it. On that, so that's a good incentive maybe to pull the thread on a little bit then. So this grant program inside of universities that you're saying is a perverse incentive, what, what's funding that? Do you know, like, where is that money coming from? And um, why is it being directed towards the empiricists and away from, I, I would call the theoreticians the rationalist typically. That's how, I, I don't know if that's the same framing you would use like empiricism versus rationalism. Um, um, not really. Theorists, first of all, we don't have in biology, we have very few theorists these days. Mm -hmm. We treat theory to the extent it exists at all as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, you will hear people say things like, you know, data is king or let's see what the data say. Right. And we think that that is synonymous with science, that obviously what makes science mm -hmm. special is that we go and check the reality in physical space. Mm -hmm. But no, this is an attack on a system that has two components. Mm -hmm. Reductionism is important. You, you have to engage in it. The real payoff comes when you take all of the products of the reductionism mm -hmm. and you go back and you do synthesis and you say, what story are all of these different results? Right. What are they pointing to? The conciliance between them. Right. Yeah. And when you get, when that conciliance hits, now you know something, yeah. right? Now you've got a model, and I don't mean a computer model, yeah. but you yeah. have a model that describes the universe in, in an important way. Yeah. So that really should be the point of the exercise. To your question, I think what has taken place is that there's a, a defect, and I know this will go to some of the other things that you like to think about, but there's a defect in the way we reward people in the component pieces of the system that mm -hmm. result in something we call science. Mm -hmm. Each of those pieces becomes like a quasi-creature that starts trying to carve out territory and starts trying to persist mm. into the future, mm -hmm. right? Most of the elements of the system should want to minimize their own expense, right? You don't want the unproductive parts of the system to be any bigger than they need to be. You don't want them to be smaller than they right. have to be. Yeah. But, you know, administrators don't see it that way. Right. Administrators understand a growth in the, you know, resources at their disposal as a positive thing. Uh -huh. um, so all of the elements of the system take on a life of their own and people forget what the objective of the system was in the first place. Mm. That, oh, wow. So yeah, you start to think about it like an ecology and maybe this is the through line, right? Between organs, organisms and organizations, right? They have this, they're basically all survival strategies of one kind or another, right? Even a business, I guess you could say is a survival strategy, right? It's trying to or a fitness strategy, maybe is the more correct term. Um, but they can come into conflict even when they are, even when one of these organizations is trying to serve, say, a higher purpose. Um, what, the pursuit of truth, I guess, would be kind of the overarching purpose for a university. But maybe the administrators in one of these particular functions inside the university, they're just trying to continue their pay stream, right? Because it, administration in particular, sorry to beat up on the administrators, but ideally we want to minimize the amount of administration expenditure that's occurring in any organization, right? Yep. You want production <laughs> occurring, not administration. Administration is a necessary function to make production work, but you really want to keep it to a minimum, right? It's like minimizing your fixed costs and mac to maximize your productive output, basically. So... I go back to, I guess I don't understand the flow of funds inside of these organizations. Like how, what is feeding the administrative layer in a way that, you know, natural selection, if I may use that term, is not checking properly? Well, actually, you you hinted at it in the, the scaling up process that you were describing. There's a reason 
that we don't have this problem with our internal organs. Mm. Right? They're an exception to this rule. Mm -hmm. Our organs are not, you know, your heart is not trying to win a competition with your liver. In mm -hmm. fact, mm -hmm. it desperately wants not to win a competition mm -hmm. with your liver because you'll die. <laughs> so the reason that you don't get that competition is that the all of the organs of which you are composed, they succeed in passing on the genetic information that led to them only if you as an organism succeed. Mm. So they are perfectly aligned. They are in perfect agreement about taking only what they need and mm. no more. And when there's not enough, how they should divide it up and which cells should commit suicide, mm. right? All of these things are without conflict because you share a genome across your entire hmm. soma. If universities worked like that, the administrators would be the same. If the administrators only got paid when the university succeeded in accomplishing the mission that's on the mission statement, hmm. then administrators would behave themselves. But that's not what happens, hmm. right? They have a conflict of interest. and. So they effectively become parasites on that system. And any time you reproduce that structure, you're going to see it. This is why Elon Musk was able to fire such a large percentage of Twitter's right. employees and make the place better, not worse. Right, right, right. Is this just inherent then? Is this just inherent in the nature of scaling human organizations that we're always going to have these conflicts of interest that arise at the different layers and we... There's no systemic solution for it. We just have to constantly deal with it as it comes up. Like, are we ever going to find this equilibrium that is organism-like in human institutions? No reason you can't find it. I think the problem, so I have a principle, which is within complex systems, you cannot blueprint a solution. Mm -hmm, if you right, try to blueprint right, a solution, right. you end up finding all sorts of unintended consequences. Because that's for complicated systems, not complex systems. Exactly. Yeah. So what you have to do is either prototype your way there or navigate your way mm -hmm. there so that you can adjust as you discover what the consequences are of the remedy you thought was mm -hmm. going to work, you can pivot. There's no reason that you can't do that. But what you must do is avoid the conflict between levels of analysis. A successful administrator who's successful because they betray the mission of the organization is an avoidable problem. Uh -huh. What you need to have is some mechanism that measures something that is highly correlated to what you're actually trying to achieve uh -huh. and then rewards people on the basis on of that. their okay. contribution to it, oh. which you will never do perfectly. Right. There will always be those conflicts. But what you want to do is try to minimize the, uh, the delta between the incentives of the entity mm -hmm. and the incentives of the components. Right, right, right. What came up for me there is you're saying it was like the earnings per share bonus structures you see in corporate America. It's like that's sort of you're trying to align executive interests with shareholder interest basically, but then that even that gets gamed a little bit because then they do the share buybacks. Well, this is a this is actually a fiat money problem because you get access to cheap credit you can borrow money at cheap rates. You can buy back your own shares, and you can game that metric essentially. But I, I was, yeah. What, what in the university system? And that, sorry to keep going back to the grants, but like I still don't know where that. What does that money come from? When you say grants, are there just private donors making these grants? Is this public? Mostly not. It's mostly public money. Oh, so it's printed money. Yeah, it's printed money. Oh, exactly. Okay. So okay. the perverse, it's perverse incentives all the way down. Okay. Um, and yeah, it, and. When we get to the part of the conversation where we discover that somehow we're living in an era where, um, you know, the only thing that's certain is that the experts are wrong, mm -hmm. right? Why are the experts wrong across the board? It's you have a system in which the whole awarding of the hallmarks of expertise is riddled with perverse incentives. And in mm -hmm. fact, anybody who attempts to straighten it out is going to be killed off because they're a threat to all of these people's fiefdoms. Wow. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to draw a connection here. The inside of the modern academy, it's all Keynesian economics, as you're probably aware. Mm -hmm. um, that is an empirical version of economics, more or less, right? They've really tried to, um, well, they've, they've applied a lot of metrics to things like math, mathematizing it and applying metrics to things that the theorists, which are the Austrian economists, will tell you you cannot quantify. For instance, you know, Mises will tell you it's impossible to quantify inflation 
because it's as subjective as the process of valuation itself, right? It's, a, it's subjective to the preferences of the individual, yet the Keynesians will tell you, oh no, we have it all for me, you know, <laughs> all the numbers say this and here's the number. And then that number, of course, conveniently changes every decade when it gets too high. The, <laughs> the metric that's supposed to predict price changes every time something inside that basket of goods changes too much, it gets excluded. Mm -hmm. So they can bring that number down into, you know, expectations or what, you know, it's a managed number basically. So not only was it, you know, you can't create a metric for it to begin with, but even after that, it's, it's engineered. Do you think the connection I want to draw is like, so those empirical Keynesian economists that have taken over the modern academy and they've excluded the theoreticians, which is Austrian economists, like, do you think th these, this is a downstream effect of that possibly that other, there's been an over indexing on empiricism and an exclusion of theoreticians? Sounds exactly parallel to what I have seen in science. And that doesn't mean it's arising for the identical reason, mm -hmm. but this is, this is why if we go back to the initial question of fitness, to me, fitness is an easy concept to understand and an impossible concept to instantiate perfectly if mm -hmm. you want to go measure it. But mm -hmm. as long as you're cool with that and you realize you're measuring a proxy, you don't, you don't run into a problem. Fitness means the ability of a sequence to get into the future. Mm -hmm. Sequences want to get into the future. Genetic mm -hmm. sequences are trying to get into the future. How far into the future? As far as they can get. Is this replicators right? replicate? I've heard, I've heard it put before. <laughs> That's a perfectly good way of thinking yeah, okay. about it. But the point is, if you know that a sequence is trying to get into the future or it is structured so as to increase the chances of getting into the future and the farther into the future it gets, the better it has done. Yeah. Once you accept that, then you understand, oh, there ought to be all kinds of circumstances in which reproducing more is not the way to do that, mm. right? In fact, mm. you are such a such a demonstration. Yeah. You are composed of some 30 trillion cells as an adult. If you wanted to increase your fitness by reproducing more, you could be 30 trillion individuals. That's a spectacular increase in fitness. Right, 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 so right. why don't you do it? Because what you give up is the ability to get into the future. Oh, right? okay. You have a spectacular ability to get into the future because of the coordinated control that you can exert on the universe around you. It's oh. worth that trade. Based on the cooperation internal. Right. Too, so, well, 100%. Yeah. So, this sounds it, like an economy, by the way. Right. So yeah. I guess the thing is, I don't, I don't think biology is as hard as we make it out to be, mm -hmm. but it's really, it's a different art than people think it is. Mm. Figuring out where to stand is like the entire game, mm -hmm. right? There's some place that you could stand that you can see the thing working. And it's like, well, of course it would work that mm -hmm. way. But most people, they find some place to stand and then they spend their entire career looking from that disadvantaged vantage point and they never make sense of it. Mm. Um, but once you understand getting into the future is the game rather than reproducing, oh my goodness, you just go around spotting places where reproduction is not helping that your cause. And it's like, oh, you can find an example for every one of these things. It's easy. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, click here to find more just like it and here to find our most recent episode. Also, make sure to like this video to help shine light on the corruption of money. And be sure to subscribe to this channel to stay connected.